Let's talk about the bacteriophage. These are, are viruses that infect only bacteria, and sometimes we simply call them phage. That's a real common term to use. So we're going to define what a phage is, and we're going to look at the two life cycles of phage, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. And I want to make sure that before we finish this video, you understand why it's important to study phage, right? You're not a bacterium. Why do you care if there are viruses that infect bacteria? Well, it turns out you should care for a variety of reasons. The first reason that I'm going to mention is that um, phage are a great model for how human viruses infect people or how plant viruses infect plants and so on. They're much easier to study from a, just a logistical standpoint and then uh, they don't have the same ethical complexities, right? It's very difficult to study, for example, Ebola virus because as far as we know, Ebola is primarily going to be in primates and humans. Very difficult to study HIV because HIV, as far as we can tell, is only found in, in primates and humans. There are major ethical concerns with studying these other viruses. We know a lot about viruses because we know a lot about phage. So that's the first reason. And then towards the end of this video, hopefully I'll give you a couple other compelling reasons for why we need to study the phage. So what exactly is a phage? It's a, a virus that infects bacteria. They have a complex symmetry, meaning that they have an icosahedral or some other polyhedral head. They have a helical tail and a set of tail fibers that are involved in specific adhesion or specific attachment. In this picture on the left, you see a, a bacterium bursting as phage particles that are attached to the outside uh, have injected their DNA, taken over, replicated, and now uh, hundreds of these phage particles are being released. So complex symmetry and almost always complex, almost always double-stranded DNA genome. There are very, very few known exceptions to either of those. Almost always complex symmetry, almost always double-stranded DNA genome. Let's talk then uh, about the lytic life cycle. There are two life cycles to phage, lytic and lysogenic. The lytic life cycle results ultimately in the lysis of the cell. That's where it gets its name from. So in step one, uh, it's typically called attachment. Some people will refer to that as adsorption. Uh, adsorption means sticking to a surface. So you've got your virion, your phage virion. Virion just means a single particle of a virus. It's got double-stranded DNA in there, and its tail fibers are going to attach to some sort of specific molecule on the surface of the host cell. Attachment is where the host specificity is determined. Attachment is where um, a, a T-even phage, like T4, distinguishes an E. coli cell from uh, a bacillus subtilis cell. Right, the surface molecules that act as receptors are going to be the surface molecules we've already learned about in gram negatives. It's going to be things like the O polysaccharide on the LPS molecule. In gram positives, it might be the tachoic acids, for example. And because these can have different sequences of sugars, and those sequences of sugars can have specific interactions with the, uh, the tail fiber protein. So in, in step one, we get some sort of specific attachment. In step two, we get penetration, meaning the, in this case, the DNA is injected across the layers of the cell envelope. The capsid remains outside, and unlike what you see in the drawing here, there's no reason for it to detach. Right, those tail fibers are still interacting with, for example, LPS molecules. And so it wouldn't let go the way this diagram has shown that it's letting go. And in fact, in the picture I showed you on the last slide, you saw a bunch of phage particles still stuck to the outside of that host cell. So that's penetration or injection, and only the DNA in a, in a phage, only the DNA is going to cross the entire cell envelope and enter into the cell. Once it gets in there, it's going to shut down most of the cell's life functions, and it's going to direct the cell to make more nucleic acid, more double-stranded DNA genomes, and more proteins. So what proteins would that be? Well, it's going to be the, the complex capsid proteins, including the tail fibers. It's going to include any enzymes, like maybe lysozyme. And once it reaches a certain critical concentration, all at once we're going to see maturation take place, assembly of the capsids and packaging of the DNA into those capsids. And then ultimately there's going to be release. Now how many 
are going to be released. That's what we call the burst size. Burst size is uh, easily between two to three hundred in many cases. So two to three hundred new virions being released as the cell is busted open, and of course the cell is going to die from this process. So you can see why they're considered obligate intracellular parasites, right? It has to get inside. It can't replicate outside the cell. Um, it's uh, a, a parasite, right? Meaning that it's going to harm the cell in the process as it consumes all the cell's resources. So this is what we call the lytic cycle of phage replication. Now, more complex than the lytic cycle is the lysogenic cycle. So virulent phage are those that only have a lytic cycle. Temperate phage are those that have both a lytic and a lysogenic cycle. So if we start at step one at the top, we can see the phage attaches. It injects its, its DNA into the host cell. Uh, its DNA will typically circularize. And then a decision point has to happen there at step number two. Uh, and when we say decision, we're anthropomorphizing. There's some molecular sensing that's going on, but there's a decision that has to take place. Either that phage can go ahead and um, immediately begin replicating itself and lyse the cell and try to escape and find a new host, or it can actually lysogenize the host, meaning it can use its, its integrase enzyme to integrate itself as its genome into the host cell's genome. That's an interesting strategy. Once it's integrated in the host cell's genome, it can just sit there quietly. And as long as the host cell is growing and dividing, the phage genome, now called a prophage, is also replicating. Remember, the whole purpose of the virus is just to make more of itself and persist so it doesn't disappear from the face of the planet. And any strategy that ensures that it doesn't disappear, disappear from the face of the planet is going to have some sort of success and some sort of um, selective advantage. At some point, though, after one round of division or a million rounds of division, it might be 20 minutes, it might be 20 years, uh, induction can occur. Induction is when the phage genome excises itself from the host chromosome and then re-enters into the lytic phase and kills the host cell by releasing actual uh, virions. So it can either replicate in the form of replicating virions or it can replicate in the form of replicating the prophage. In either case, the virus is persisting and that's how it survives. That's what survival is all about. Now, a couple key things that I want to point out here that can happen uh, during lysogeny. When the prophage integrates, it's somewhat random, which means that it can actually interrupt a gene. And if that gene is essential, it can kill the cell. Oops, don't want to do that. Um, when it replicates, when the, the host cell is replicating, DNA polymerase makes mistakes. Mutations are, um, are occurring during this whole process. And so depending on how many rounds of division it stays in this prophage state, the phage may pick up mutations in key places that either inactivate the phage entirely, so it's useless, or maybe just inactivate its ability to ever induce and excise itself. When we look at the genomes of bacteria, we often find what we call cryptic phage. Phage that have uh, incorporated themselves, in, lysogenized the host, and then through mutation lost their ability to ever excise themselves and move on with life as individual virions. So it's important to understand that that can happen um, to a phage that has lysogenized its host cell. So one question is, what happens I'm going to erase some of these so we can see more clearly. What happens at this decision point here in the middle? How does this phage uh, determine whether or not it's best to use the resources of the host cell and lyse it uh, right then and there and burst, you know, what, two to three hundred new virions or integrate itself, its genome, into the genome of its host as a prophage and sort of ride the wave of cell division for a while. Well, the, the main determining factor is going to be the health of the host cell. If the host cell is healthy and looks like it's able to undergo multiple rounds of division, lysogeny is a great way to go um, because lysogeny could result very rapidly in millions of copies as opposed to hundreds of copies 
of the phage. If, however, the host cell is not doing well, if it's a sick host cell, if it's not actively dividing, then lysogeny is a dead end. If you get to this stage here and the host cell doesn't have the resources it needs, it's not healthy enough to grow and divide by binary fission, then this is a dead end and you've just uh, wasted your time and you're not going to make any more of yourself. The same is true up here. A lysogenized host that's all of a sudden in trouble maybe uh, too much exposure to UV light and it's risking cell death or it's, it's uh, run out of food or something that triggers an SOS response through cell damage is likely to trigger the phage, uh, prophage to excise itself and for it to basically bail out and jump ship and say, all right, this, this is a sinking ship. We're getting out of here with what resources we can. Because once it exists extracellularly as a virion, it can exist like that for who knows how long safely until it finds a new host cell. If, however, this cell here that it's lysogenized dies, uh, it can't escape again. It has to, has to escape while that cell still has some resources. If that cell is dead, then there's no way for that phage to escape. So there are some molecular quote-unquote decisions that are being made through this whole process of lytic and, ly and uh, lysogenesis in a temperate phage. Okay, why does lysogeny matter? Because it turns out lysogeny changes the host bacterium. Two key changes that are important for us to consider. Lysogenic host cells, so once they've been lysogenized are, lysogenized, are often immune to reinfection by the same or a similar virus strain. It appears to be a way for that virus to claim that host cell as its own, so no others can jump in. It's a, it's a form of competition, essentially. How does it do that? Well, for example, in Salmonella, it changes the O polysaccharide on the LPS. And that O polysaccharide then is no longer accessible for attachment. It doesn't become a receptor anymore for similar viruses. So immunity to reinfection is uh, very common among uh, lysogenized host cells. There's also something called phage conversion. We talked about this earlier in the form of transduction. Trans, if I can spell, duction. This is when uh, a phage leaves uh, uh, when, when a, a lysogenic prophage excises itself from the host chromosome, it often is a sloppy process, and it takes with it some of the DNA of the host chromosome, which means that when it, it replicates itself and packages itself into new virions, those new virions that are leaving are not just phage DNA, they're also carrying bacterial DNA with them. They then go and inject themselves someplace else, and they're injecting that DNA from the previous host with them. On occasion, they're taking with them something that's valuable to the new host cell. Maybe uh, an E. coli was lysogenized with a T4, and when that T4 excised itself, it brought some antibiotic resistance genes with it. And then when it escapes and lysogenizes now a salmonella cell, all of a sudden it's injecting not only its own DNA into that salmonella, but some antibiotic resistance genes along with it. So slowly but surely, we do see new properties that can be conferred by these bacteriophage with this process called phage conversion. Here's three examples that I dug up that are all interesting. Crinibacterium diphtheriae causes diphtheria. The diphtheria toxin is found associated with a lysogenic phage that's now cryptic. It's lost its ability to leave, meaning that the toxin is permanently in the crinibacterium genome. Clostridium botulinum, the botulinum toxin that's found in, in C. botulinum is associated with uh, a phage, with a ly lysogenic phage. Vibrio cholerae, the cholera toxin associated with a lysogenic phage. So just some examples of how transduction, this phage conversion process, can actually convert what was once a harmless organism, it's very likely crinibacterium, clostridium, and vibrio, these original strains, were relatively harmless, just minding their own business, and they've all become pathogens through this phage conversion. So you can imagine all kinds of properties changing as a result of lysogeny. Here's another reason why it's important for us to understand the phage. Uh, phage may be uh, an important and effective antibacterial strategy in the near future. There are labs studying how to do what's called phage therapy, where <clears throat> we're going after pathogens with phage rather than antibiotics, because it's believed that resistance to phage 
uh, would be more costly to the bacterium than resistance to the antibiotic, and so it would evolve uh, much more slowly than antibiotic resistance would. And since phage don't infect you and me, uh, an inhaler full of phage particles would only go after very specifically the bacteria that you're trying to get. So in this case, there's an example uh, back, a story from 2013 of a lab studying ways to use phage that are specific to C. diff to see if they could kill C. diff without killing any of the other bacteria in the gut and therefore causing all the other side effects of antibiotics. So let's do a quick lesson summary. Phage are viruses that infect only bacteria. They typically have complex symmetry and typically have double-stranded genomes. The virulent or lytic phage automatically lyse their host cell. The lysogenic or temperate phage have the option to either lyse their host cell or integrate their chromosome into the host cell chromosome. And then finally, phage are important models for understanding human viruses. And in one of the upcoming videos, we're going to compare, OK, what do we know about phage and how they get in and get out? And what do we think we know about similar processes in human viruses? Hope to see you at that, uh, at that next lecture.